I'm talking today uh, about some work uh, that Katie and I have been collaborating on um, that's drawing from some of the arguments uh, from a book uh, that we're doing. Now, I'm going to say some inflammatory things that I hope stimulate conversation. You should know that all of the obnoxious inflammatory things that you hate, uh, they were Katie's idea. <laughs> no, no, they're, they're very much mine. She's, I think, much more sensible about these things. I, I enjoy being provocative in such a space. So, but I do hope we have a good conversation um, uh, as we move forward. So look, uh, continuing from Katie's discussion about vaccine mandates, we sometimes talk in policy circles as if uh, should we have a mandate or not is a question about a unitary concept, a unitary kind of policy. Katie's done some work to show that they're not um, and talked about different ways we want to distinguish different kinds of mandate policies. I'm interested today to draw out um, unintended but foreseeable bad consequences of certain kinds of mandate policies and particular bad consequences for uh, broader aspects of our shared social and political worlds. Yeah? And the argument is not that just because there are these bad consequences, we should not have mandates, but that advocates of mandates need to understand, identify, uh, engage with, and be prepared to respond to these kind of consequences when they happen. And I think far too often they're not. Uh, let's see. Uh, one of the great things about collaborating interdisciplinarily is, is we can use the politics of who cares about which journals. So like, uh, no one in my department cares about Milbank, so Katie goes first there. But uh, it, you should read this p paper in bioethics. <laughs> really great, okay. Um, <laughs> Um, so I want to talk about four different kinds of unintended but foreseeable bad social political consequences of mandates. I think there are many, many more, and many people in this room have written about some of these other ones. Um, uh, and happy to talk about some of the other ones in the discussion too. But I want to talk about what I call, or what, what we call, uh, co-opted governance, a badly politicized physicians, uh, the illegitimate governance of dissenters, and political polarization. So four that I hope I can do. Uh, in my 18 minutes now remaining. So one, the idea of co-opted governance, um, th and I want to talk particularly about efforts to tighten uh, vaccine uh, mandates in the context of California. So, so Katie and I are, are in the middle of drafting a book uh, about the broader social political issues surrounding California's reforms uh, as a way to dig deep uh, about a topic that, that hopefully we can draw lessons from broader context. So my examples will draw on California uh, in light of uh, the kind of reforms Saad uh, discussed. So when you eliminate non-medical exemptions in the context of school immunization mandates, one thing you do is you co-opt people into forms of governance that they might not have signed up for. Right, so one thing you do if you've got private persons operating daycare or private schools, you've now made them public officials tasked with governance. If you've got public employees who are running public schools, sure they, they work for the government, but they don't work for the public health department, but now they do. If you've got private physicians who now you're regulating, uh, you're requiring them to provide uh, uh, immunization education, as in some states, or in California after 276, you're having the public health department regulate their determinations about medical contraindications, right? Now you are governing them or involving them in government. Right? And this matters, among other things, because it makes penal spaces out of spaces that, that don't need to be politicized. They don't need to be spaces of governance. Now again, you might decide this is the right thing to do, all things considered, but there's a cost. There's a cost to politicizing these spaces and to co-opting people into governance uh, who might not be there. And, and, and we know some of these costs, so you might push back and say, well, they're there already. Yeah, but the idea of selective enforcement, right? We often talk about non-medical exemptions as if what we're protecting are the conscience rights of refusers, but we're also protecting everybody else from not having to be gov uh, uh, involved in governance. You're protecting physicians and teachers and daycare operators to not have to be baddies when you have non-medical exemptions. It's not just about the people getting the exemptions. Um, so this, this was on Twitter, this is from, from uh, uh, New York, I don't know how true this is, uh, but this is a, a child holding, holding a poster from his schoolmates signed by his teacher uh, and, and his friends saying we will miss you because uh, uh, he can no longer go to school because he has, uh, his parents have a religious objection to vaccines. Now I show this because uh, uh, the responses to this from the, all the pro-vax people I follow were to say nasty things about this kid's mom. And, and I'm sure we can question her decision making if you want. Um, but, but notice, it's not just that he's kicked out of school, but it has turned his teacher and his classmates into participants in a kind of governance. It has made this a place of enforcement. That's a cost we need to pay attention to, uh, especially in light of uh, the fact that we're talking about a, a significant number of people. So this is, this is uh, putting some numbers on that, that sort of increasing risk, uh, uh, number of people who are not governed by mandates. These are the increase in homeschoolers. There's the increase in homeschoolers uh, in California 
After SB 277, uh, schools as a place of governance. And, and we have reason to think that different kinds of schools and teachers are going to have different kinds of incentives, right? They're not, they didn't sign up to be public health baddies. Um, and so uh, um, we see the sort of breakdown in the difference of the enforcement at private schools and a charter school. I don't know if, if you know, charter schools are uh, privately operated schools that take public money. So they're accessible to public students, but they're often operated by nonprofits, sometimes by for profit corporations. Um, but they have an incentive to get the kids in the door, especially if you're tuition dependent as a private school. Um, and so it's reasonable to think that they're going to have a strong incentive to allow the provisional admi uh, admittance. And I saw, talked about how that was cracked down on, the conditional or provisional uh, 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 enrollment, but now they're tolerating the overdue. As you can imagine, right? So, so you might criticize you, oh, why aren't they enforcing the law? Well, that's not their job. You might say, well, it should be their job. Well, well good luck convincing these uh, school secretaries and school administrators that's their job. Okay, now I'm going to say something really inflammatory. If you've been following California, the debate there is about cracking down on physicians offering so-called fraudulent medical exemptions. They're writing that these kids have medical contraindications so they can go to school even though they're not contraindications that are generally recognized. So the idea is now the public health department will review and dismiss uh, um, any of these exemptions uh, applications submitted by the, or signed off on by the physicians if they don't meet certain criteria. And, and these physicians doing this, many of them uh, uh, have been sort of subject to, to fierce criticism. They've been named and shamed in the literature. I want to say that, that you can understand how a virtuous physician might end up writing such a fraudulent exemption as a consequence of having what you might think of as an all things considered expansive conception of the best interests of their patient. Right? So suppose I've got a patient who I know their parents are never going to vaccinate that kid. Suppose I also know we live in a community with relatively high vaccination rates. So as I know that if I don't sign this medical exemption form, that kid is not going to go to school. Suppose I know mom is not even going to be good at homeschooling, or I have some reason to think that. So from an all things considered perspective, I might see myself doing good by writing this form. This maybe, maybe I'm not uh, acting viciously. I'm not defending this. I'm not saying this is good. I'm not saying we should agree with this. But I'm saying we should expect it. Physicians got into their job to serve their patients, not to be enforcers of public health law. Right? So when you put them in this position, you should expect it. And, and I don't think 276 is going to resolve these questions entirely. I'm very interested to see what the next sort of replacement effect pushback is going to be. Uh, and, and just to point it out, in the U.S. context, we have a long history of physicians acting this way for their patients. Right? When we had the draft in Vietnam War, right, our current president received a, a, a medical exemption for his bone spurs, which seemed not to have affected his life in any way. Uh, after that time. Uh, it's common in communities with massive unemployment for physicians to write uh, and sign off on disability applications so people can receive social security disability, even though the disability is understood in a social way. Namely, they're disabled for all the jobs that exist in the community because there are no jobs in the community. Right? Okay. Um, so I really like the way in which uh, um, uh, Julie and Margie talk about this issue in the context of Australia's policies, that namely we need to recognize that there are people for whom an exemption would be a best, all things best, uh, uh, all things considered uh, promotion of their best interests. Right, so if you think about, for example, they have a case of uh, the family's just not going to vaccinate and, and they're going to have to think about moving or changing jobs to get kids in, in daycare. Okay, so that was one. Badly politicized physicians. Here's what I mean about this. I think physicians, and, and I, I'm talking about physicians because notably, uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, hospital and school social workers are not involved in these public politicized debates in the way physicians are in the United States. So physicians get badly politicized, I think, when they take arguments that are great for making recommendations in clinic and they apply them in an uncritical way for making recommendations about state power. Right? So you become badly politicized when you've turned something that's good clinical judgment into something for practice. So, so you know, Walter Ornstein has this, this nice point that I really like in a recent news article. From a medical point of view, I like mandates. I like tightening. He's particularly talking about the tightening down. I like them. Uh, I'm worried they backfire. I like how that reveals two things. But there can be a medical point of view from which we can sort of really like the uptake in vaccination, but we should worry about the political consequences. And when we don't, in particular when physicians don't, they become bad, badly politicized in these uh, debates. So, so just... I'm a philosopher, so let's, let's do a couple quick arguments. We love to like, number our premises and talk about our conclusions. Um, here's a good but uninteresting argument. Vaccines are good for kids. Physicians should do what's good for kids. Therefore, physicians should do the vaccine thing. Yay, great. Here's what goes wrong. 
Premise one, same premise, yay, vaccine's good for kids, two prime. Physicians should, uh, philosophers love this, we modify our premises by saying prime, or like double prime, it's, it's really obnoxious. Um, physicians should intervene in parental decision making directly or through the state to promote what's good for kids. Looks a little like two, but it's not. And if you think two prime is the same as two, you've done something very wrong. Because then it follows physicians should intervene in parental decision making to ensure children get vaccinated. So this is actually part of a broader clinical ethics debate in pediatric ethics, right, about the role of physicians in intervening. Um, and look, two prime's false because it's often net harmful to forcibly intervene to prevent parents from making moderately suboptimal decisions. So for example, I think dismissing families from practice is a kind of intervention. And if you dismiss families from practice because they're not vaccinating and the consequence is kids aren't getting care, then no, you've done something net harmful for that kid, that family. Okay. Badly politicized physicians. So one way to cash out how I think physicians are badly politicized is if you read the American Academy of Pediatrics statement and the American Medical Association statement, uh, they're both strongly against non-medical exemptions. They're both strongly in favor of California's efforts, Maine's efforts, New York's efforts, what we're seeing in Connecticut and, and other states. Um, but their evidence basis is crap. Here's how it goes. Vaccines are good for kids. If you eliminate non-medical exemptions, more kids will get vaccines, right? And, and helpfully, sod is all over, right? Piece of evidence number two. But that is an argument that ignores all kinds of foreseeable unintended costs in our social and political world that come from mandates, right? And you can't say, once you've entered the public sphere, you don't get to say, oh, I'm just a doctor. I only talk about the medical stuff. Sorry, you entered the public sphere now. All right, last thing. Now, now here's, here's a, a bit more philosophical. A lot of people are talking about a crisis of authority in liberal democratic societies. There's a crisis about what to believe, who's speaking the truth, how do we know what's fake and what's real. There's a crisis of a kind of moral authority. How do we know what's right and what to follow? Now, you might just say, well, this is a, a perennial problem. Maybe it's a reason not to endorse democracy. That's what Plato thought. Ever read The Republic? Yeah, you totally should, right? It's, it's great about how liberal democracy is bad. And you should want like experts involved. He thought philosophers should be kings and queens. Maybe you think doctors should be kings and queens. But it seems to be getting worse, especially as educational expertise is becoming increasingly politically polarized. So this is something, I don't know if, if, you, if, you, if you like Pigasy and, and his work, uh, but, but his, this comes from a paper and from his recent book. And he's shown that left parties, parties on the political left that used to be parties of the common people, are increasingly parties of the elite from a point of view of education and sort of technocratic responses to problem solving. And what does that mean? Well, it means a couple things. One, people who are members of left parties, including members of the technocratic elite, think they're still members of people's parties, and they're not. Right? Because the elites are always gonna be criticized. But it also means that physicians, if they advocate in clinic, well, sure, they're just members of a trusted profession. But when they enter the public sphere and make arguments, they're doing so as members of one side of a political cultural war. That's not to say all physicians are lefties, of course they're not. But the idea of um, uh, sort of public health policy and, and governance through elimination of non-medical exemptions is about a kind of technocratic governance, right? That left parties have been leading. I'll talk about that on, on my sort of fourth idea of political polarization. Right. So understand that when you enter the political sphere arguing for non-medical exemptions, you're doing so not as the beloved doctor in clinic, but as m members of a, a political class. Illegitimate governance. So there's quotations around this because I think you might push back and rightly so about what I mean by illegitimate here and I, I wanna be, be honest about that. We can ask lots of normative questions, lots of value-laden questions about mandates. Right, we can say, are they, are they ethical? Do they help us balance the harms and the benefits? That's important. Are they legal? There's a lot of discussion about this. People say, oh, well, there was a Supreme Court case that upheld that. Oh, we've had laws on the books for years. <laughs> are they just? Are there these laws consist with people's liberties, with their political rights. But we can also ask, and, and I'm, I'm sometimes disappointed, that we don't hear people talk enough about legitimacy. Now, not all of you are political philosophers, right? So let me unpack what political legitimacy is, as it's different from ethics, law, and justice. So legitimacy is about whether a regime or its command, its laws, do or should cultivate obedience. So legitimacy is about political obligation. Do you have a sense that these are laws you have to follow? Right? So another way of putting it is, are you sort of principally 
committed to the political project you're doing with your fellow citizens, or are you just motivated by trying to avoid going to prison and you'll resist whenever you can get away with it? When we talk about legitimacy, it's different from these other concepts because I can say uh, that maybe I have a duty or an obligation to follow laws even if they're somewhat unjust or unethical, right? I think my tax rates should be higher and I think, uh, you know, some wars we should not be fighting, but I still, I think I have an obligation to pay my taxes and at least not like, uh, you know, assault rich people and steal their money and give it to the tax man. Uh, likewise, I might have a duty to disobey laws even if they're ethical or just if they uh, are sort of against my fundamental values or, or I'm, I'm certainly going to be willing to violate those laws. Now, of course, I'm not going to recognize them as ethical or just, but that's just the point. Just because someone said, hey, these mandate laws are just, doesn't mean people are going to see them as consistent with their values. Okay, and, and there's good reasons to think that at least some vaccine refusers are not going to see mandates as consistent with their values, right? If they think kids have a fundamental right to education, so if you're kicking them out of school, you're denying them of a fundamental right. People maybe have an absolute right to bodily integrity. I don't think that, but some people very much do. And they think vaccination mandates impinge on that. Parents, perhaps, have a nearly absolute right to make medical decisions for their children. This might seem crazy to you, but a lot of Americans think this. There's a deep tradition of politics and political thinking, right? John Locke famously says, right, this state exists to serve the family, not the other way around, right? We come to the state already with rights and responsibilities that then the, the state respects, right? It does not impinge upon. So I worry about illegitimacy because it is so contagious and so toxic and you can't solve it with the state because what illegitimacy does, worries about illegitimacy do, is they question the authority of the state's power. So the state can't resolve questions about illegitimacy by using its power. Because we very much, right, that's what's called into question. Okay, so here's a quick flow chart. I sometimes when we think about governing dissenters, this, this applies broadly, but I think obviously narrowly to vaccine mandates, we can think about whether or not we're going to let dissenters or force dissenters to leave. It can be secession. We might let them form small communities that are not going to be governed in the same way. We do this in the States with some communities like the Amish. We allow some kinds of separatism. I don't think that's a live option for vaccine policy, but perhaps. We have been uh, allowing dissenters to escape governance. That's exemptions. But what if you don't have exemptions or secession separatism? Well, if there are many, many dissenters, then you've got a war on your hands. It might not be a fighting war, but it'd be a, co a cold war, a war about legitimacy. Some people have argued that the Republican Party is engaged in a cold war against the Democratic Party, and the Democrats don't know it namely because the Republicans don't recognize Democrats as legitimately holding power. And so they're willing to take whatever means they can to avoid Democrats holding power, right? Because they reject the legitimacy of Democratic rule. Some people have suggested such a thing. Okay, but we don't have that, hopefully, right, anytime soon. So there are very few dissenters. You might think, though, that with few dissenters, you end up just with a silently governed minority. It's a tiny number of people. It's one to two percent. Ah, but what if there is ideological allies? Well, then you've got political polarization, Two minutes to say something about that. But here's just something quick. If you've been watching the, the kind of violence that's gone on in California, State Senator Pan assaulted in the street, someone threw menstrual blood uh, from the gallery onto the senators below deliberating, uh, I think these show that there are some people who have given up on the system, right? They are not recognizing what's going on as legitimate. Um, okay, finally, political polarization. We're worried about political polarization for a long time with vaccines. I think mandates introduce a new way to risk political polarization, right? So, Here's the new ways. One, if you're attacking parental rights, then you are going to trigger people, incline people who are very committed to parental rights to be more skeptical of vaccine mandates, even if they wouldn't have been skeptical about vaccine mandates before. So some people often say, uh, in America, there's no political polarization on vaccine mandates, uh, on, vaccine, on vaccines, science, and on vaccine mandates. That's true of the general population. It's certainly not true of the political parties and their leaders. But you can even do something worse. I, I see over and over again from politicians and from members of the media who make the following argument. If you are against Senate Bill 276, you are anti-vax. You might think you're doing something powerful there, right? You're getting everyone who loves vaccines to stand behind efforts to crack down in your mandate policy. Uh, but guess what? Now you've just inclined everyone who objects to your policy to be more sympathetic with anti-vax sentiments. So it's a destructive, polarizing kind of argument. And, and, and I mean, I'm not picking on Dan Salmon here, but, but he says, uh, this was earlier this year, I don't think vaccine policy is politically polarized. Uh, it's a partisan issue, rather. Uh, and he's right. It's not for common, everyday people yet. But it certainly is for party leaders. 
In the United States, uh, there's a, a recent issue of uh, American Journal of Public Health. Um, basically, all the bills pushed to expand mandates come from uh, uh, um, Democrats. All the bills to expand permissiveness of mandates or to eliminate them come from Republicans. Uh, this is the, the, the case in California. You want to say California's a great success? It's a failure from the point of view of political polarization. No Republican senators voted for Senate Bill 276. Not only that, the Republicans, even after Senator Pan's assaulted in the street, right, sent a message that they are with the protesters, right, who were throwing the blood and assaulting people. I'm not blaming advocates of 276, but I'm saying this is what you should expect when you engage in mandates that trigger polarization. Uh, here's the most frightening thing, and, and then I'll conclude. We often hold up West Virginia, Mississippi as the great exemplars of these are the states that haven't had non-medical exemptions since the 60s or at all. Republican leaders in those states have now introduced measures to eliminate or to temper the existing mandates. Why? Because you've made mandates a polarized political issue. That's a horrible thing. Okay, I'm happy in the discussion to talk about in, uh, broader national, international um, consequences uh, of these kinds or other kinds of costs. But for now, uh, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you.